Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really wonderful to see such a large uh, group of people here. And um, I'd also just like to apologize. I've been really laid down with a rather nasty cold um, over the last week, and I'm only just getting through it. And so if I have a fit of, fit of coughing, which is possible, just let me do it and you know, twiddle your thumbs or something like that. Um, and also, I'd like to very much thank the organisers, uh, and particularly Britt Bailey, for their kind invitation to uh, come and talk at uh, this conference, and for all the effort that you put into uh, this in organising the presentation. So less than two months ago, the Directorate General for Research and Innovation at the European Commission in Brussels published a report entitled Getting Cultural Heritage to Work for Europe. Compiled by a group of heritage professionals, this is an independent study undertaken for the European Commission's Horizon 2020 programme, which, for those unfamiliar with this term, refers to the current six-year framework of European Commission funding to support research and innovation across the disciplines that is also intended to achieve greater collaboration between academia, industry, and the private and public sectors, and to enable more applied research aimed at addressing the major challenges facing European societies. As an independent study, the report does not necessarily reflect European policy or the views of the Directorate General, and this is explicitly stated. Also, as it was prepared by a group of heritage professionals, it is obviously in their own interest to present the multiple values of cultural heritage in a positive light. Nonetheless, it is instructive, in the light of the themes of this conference, to briefly consider their arguments and proposals, if for no other reason than because the report's target audience is neither heritage professionals or fellow academics, but government leaders, policy makers, public servants, and business and civic society leaders. Convincing even some members of these groups about the importance of cultural heritage, as every one of you in this room is only, uh, only too aware, can be challenging, to say the least. The opening paragraph to the executive summary captures very well the thrust of the report, so it's just worth uh, restating here. I'm not going to read it. Now, to make their case, the authors of the report argue that the innovative approaches uh, that innovative approaches to the use of cultural heritage are needed so as to promote economic growth and jobs, social cohesion and environmental su sustainability. And they suggest this can be done on these three, uh, in these three areas in the following way. After providing some examples of how cultural heritage has been used in different European settings to accomplish one or other of these goals, the authors propose four primary target actions that should help reinforce Europe's socio-economic, cultural and natural capital. Now, I do, want, do not want to elaborate further on the details of this report, which is freely available and you can read it at your leisure. My reason for introducing it at the start of a talk that is supposed to be about African heritage challenges is instead partly simply to indicate that even on a continent such as Europe, with long traditions of promoting, protecting, and celebrating cultural heritage, the case in favour of cultural heritage still has to be made and repeated and repeated again and again. More critically, though, I also want to use the fact of this report, and to a certain extent some of its substance, as a foil against which we might reflect on how heritage professionals in Africa are making the case for protecting and conserving cultural heritage. What are the possible implications to some of the approaches and arguments that are now being made on the continent? And what practical and epistemological challenges may lie ahead in the medium term of the next half century or so? I'm certainly not arguing that models being proposed by European heritage professionals for European cultural heritage are necessarily desirable for African settings, and particularly in the light of Mary Louise's opening remarks. And among the criticisms I have of this report are that it positions European heritage far too frequently as something that other societies and cultures universally admire, and perhaps even envy, although this is not actually explicitly stated, 
and that in promoting the need for usable pasts, the authors seem ignorant of the fact that African heritage professionals have assiduously explored the intellectual, practical and socio-political significance of usable pasts for well over 60 years. African heritage professionals, in other words, may be even better placed to advise European governments and societies on how to make effective use of their cultural heritage than their European counterparts. What follows then is a series of vignettes, all drawn from topics that I have written about more extensively elsewhere, and that I want to suggest are African heritage challenges, which require greater consideration, and in many cases, if they are not uh, to be negotiated successfully, by which I mean so as to minimise detrimental effects on cultural heritage, are likely to require organisational <coughs> changes, redirection of research activities and management resources, and greater intellectual, intellectual scrutiny than has sometimes been the case heretofore. I make no claim that this list is a comprehensive. I'm sure we will hear about many others over the course of this conference. And I have even left out one significant heritage challenge, namely the protection, research and management of African maritime and underwater cultural heritage, about which I have also written and which remains, for me, an issue of concern and interest. I must also stress that I approach these issues from my perspective as an archaeologist, although I hope I'm, one, I'm someone who has embraced the notion of transdisciplinary research. And as a consequence, I probably give greater weight to challenges that relate to tangible rather than intangible cultural heritage. This is not meant to diminish the significance of intangible cultural heritage and the work that has been done and is being done and is being done to promote intangible heritage in different settings on the continent. However, I am sceptical, and it was interesting to hear again Mary Louise's comments, I am sceptical about the long-term value of the distinction between tangible and intangible heritage, at least as articulated by UNESCO and its supporters. And I am more in favour instead of a, a, a more holistic perspective. As I mentioned in my abstract, the term heritage means different things to different people and has diverse connotations even within related disciplines and discourses. Literally meaning that which can be inherited, the term is now used to refer to all, to all forms of cultural property, including its common use within archaeology in reference to specific artefacts or sites, within ecology and conservation to refer to ecosystems and landscapes, and, with anth and within anthropology, history and development studies as a synonym for local tradition and knowledge. Within academia, the term tends to be seen as a positive attribute, as something that needs to be protected from unrestrained modernization, as a source of pride, as a guide to development based on indigenous knowledge, and to be used as a resource to promote tourism, although none of these are without their particular problems and challenges, as we will likely hear from other presenters, especially Sabine Marshall, Mathilde Leloup, and Nyama Jane Clifford Collard. However, in the public sphere, certain kinds of cultural heritage, or more specifically, the use of scarce financial and human resources to protect and conserve them, can be seen in a more negative light, imposing an, unafford an unaffordable financial burden and drawing resources away from other more pressing concerns, such as provision of good public health and education services or clean water. It is partly in response to such negative perceptions of the cost to public finances of maintaining cultural heritage as a social good, that heritage professionals are now arguing that cultural heritage, as already alluded to with reference to Europe, needs to be put to work. Nice neoliberal principle, isn't that? Uh, a part of the reason why attitudes to cultural at, uh, heritage can be so ambivalent, I would like to suggest, is due to its dual temporality. As heritage, it is necessarily of the past, and in many cases the past of some considerable time ago. Yet cultural heritage also exists in the present, and whether tangible or intangible is something that requires dealing with in our everyday lives. This dual temporality, a manifestation of tradition in the modern world, 
can thus create a perception that cultural heritage works to hold back progress and development rather than enabling these. This may be taken quite literally in the sense that archaeological impact assessments and mitigation work may be considered unnecessarily time-consuming luxuries that delay construction and mining projects, adding financial cost to these without any immediately obvious monetary returns. Or, when conceived primarily as something of the past, cultural heritage, especially re with respect to cultural practices and beliefs, may be deemed anti-modern and retrograde. Within the context of Africa, with its complex histories of European and other colonial encounters, different categories of heritage may also be valued differently, some despised and to be deliberately neglected or even destroyed, others to be celebrated as a source of indigenous innovation and accomplishments, and other traces simply ignored. And we will hear more on such issues, I'm sure, in several of the presentations to come, especially those of Christoph Rauch, Ephraim Wahomi, and Marieke Kuipers. Yet as all of you probably know, the importance of laying claim to and demonstrating that African societies had histories that were as diverse and as rich as those of Europe and North America was also a central part of the process of decolonization and was recognized by several of the first generation of leaders of independent African nations. The best known of these is probably this quote from uh, Sir Soretsi Kama, Botswana's first president at the University of Botswana, Lesotho and Swaziland's uh, graduation ceremony in 1970. And it's always the quote that you use in introducing uh, uh, Archaeology 101 when teaching in, in Africa to encourage people about the importance of the discipline. In fact, similar statements can be found in the speeches of other generation, first generation African leaders, including uh, President Kwame Nkrumah of, Tanzania, of Ghana and President Julius Nereri of Tanzania. The importance of, a past, of the past as a source of identity and self-confidence was also central to many of the writings of the earliest proponents of pan-Africanism, including Sheikh Anta Diop and William Dubois, many of which incorporated a notion of negritude. As, it, as developed by Aimé Césaire and Léopold Senghor. The debate stimulated by the publication of Martin Bernal's Black Athena in 1987 likewise underlined the significance and importance of history and notions about the past in contemporary constructions of per personal and national identity in newly independent African countries. The promotion and preservation of Africa's diverse cultures and indigenous knowledge systems was also one of the goals of NEPAD, the new Partnership for Africa's Development, launched in, in 2001. It is thus somewhat ironic, to say the least, that the teaching and practice of archaeology and heritage studies, despite such overt statements, have received only limited <coughs> government support in most independent African nations, and the lack of resources and trained personnel have been recurrent narrative tropes in most commentary on the state of these disciplines, whether by Africans or outsiders. As if to underline this devaluing of the importance of, of history and heritage by African governments, Neil Parsons has noted that Suretsi Kama's famous exhortation about the value of the past is now frequently rendered as a nation without a culture is a nation without a soul, in official references to the speech, thus removing any reference to history. Now, one of the reasons why both uh, the contributions, both actual and potential, of archaeological and heritage uh, research are so poorly recognised, may lie in the assumption that, at least in terms of archaeology, it is a simply modernist and largely Western invention. Now, if considered as a formal academic discipline, this may well be true. The birth of archaeology as a disciplinary practice in the 19th century certainly gave a particular value to things as sources of evidence about the past, founded on a combination of the principles of Newtonian physics and Cartesian metaphysics, as Julian Thomas has elegantly explained. However, it is well known that individuals throughout the world place considerable importance on the historical associations of particular objects, buildings and spaces, and there is a growing body of well-documented examples of non-Western societies 
using elements of the physical remains of previous inhabitants of their world <coughs> in their construction of an historical narrative about their place in that world <coughs> and their relationship to previous inhabitants. And this has important consequences for what has been, been pre preserved and why and also how such alternative archaeologies, i.e. historically informed reading of material traces, <coughs> may be deployed in the management of heritage resources today. Excuse me. <coughs> and I suspect uh, Len van Schalkwijk will provide some examples of this in his paper. Unfortunately, the manner in which historical objects are mobilised by different contemporary societies to construct a past has been poorly studied, although a well-established disciplinary subfield, ethno-archaeology, must surely be the best one of the best research strategies available for identifying the characteristics of different indigenous archaeologies and heritage making. So here's my first challenge for you. In many parts of the world, the development of indigenous archaeology, whoops, that's not my first challenge, that is. <laughs> in many of the uh, parts of the world, the development of indigenous archaeology has been linked to the development of post-colonial perspectives and practices. This has perhaps been most clearly articulated by Sonia Atalay, who has called for the development of a collaborative approach that blends the strengths of Western archaeological science with the knowledge and epistemologies of indigenous peoples. In a similar vein, Smith and Vobst have argued for an archaeology shaped by indigenous knowledges, capable of decolonizing archaeological theory and practice. Most recently, George Nicholas has stated that failure to incorporate indigenous approaches within the discipline will limit significantly or marginalize the potential contributions of archaeology as a more representative and responsible discipline and constrain its continued intellectual growth. A basic feature of these statements is that they draw a contrast between archaeological approaches to understanding and writing about the past and indigenous constructs of history and the knowledge systems of which these form a part. In the excited examples and in broader trends within the discipline, the goals of promoting indigenous archaeology are to celebrate these alternative strategies, challenge long-held assumptions about who has the right authority and power to interpret the past, and wrest exclusive control over the production and use of archaeological and historical knowledge from the dis uh, formal academic disciplines. Beyond this, however, there is considerable difference between various calls for the de development of indigenous archaeologies and in the issues and in the issues. Scholars working in Africa have certainly noted that the heritage professions governing paradigms and epistemologies often conflict with African historical needs, views of, of the past and ways of structuring time and space. Recognition of this has encouraged for alternative archaeologies. Nonetheless, there have been relatively few, few explicit calls for the development of indigenous archaeologies on the continent. And instead, recent debates have focused more on the need for the creation of post-colonial archaeological practices, the ethical issues this raises, the mechanisms by which this transformation might be achieved, and their possible consequences. Where the concept of indigenous archaeology without a capital I has featured in recent discussions, it is usually used somewhat interchangeably for different manifestations of archaeological engagement with the public and the local, aka, in other words, indigenous communities, or with reference to the importance of indigenous or customary custodianship and other strands of indigenous knowledge <coughs> in heritage management and applied archaeology. In both regards, the concept of community or public archaeology seems to be preferred over indigenous archaeology. This contrasts with the situation in many other parts of the world, especially North America and Australasia, where the concept of indigenous archaeology first gained intellectual capital. Now, defining the term indigenous is complicated, as the appellation indigenous, indigenous can mean quite different, that's indigenous with a capital I and without a capital I, can mean quite different things in different contexts. 
In one sense, we are all indigenous, at least in particular settings, since we all have some ties to a particular space within the broader global community. And in a context such as uh, Africa, where the majority of the population would probably describe themselves, if asked, as indigenous, there may be little call or cause for self-definition as such even though there may have been a long history of colonisation as experienced across much of sub-Saharan Africa. Be that as it may, I still hold that we should not lose sight of Africa's poor, rural and politically non-dominant peoples, who are often considered exotic or marginal by their urban and agricultural neighbours, and as a result, commonly experience various forms of prejudice, discrimination and a lack of certain key human rights. These communities more closely qualify for designation as indigenous peoples, in other words, with capital I and capital P. And as understood in terms of the 2007 United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Botswana's Noakwe uh, populations, known as San in the academic literature, and Basawa in Setswana, are an obvious example. Although the Botswana government has frequently contested their claim to such status, arguing instead that all Batswana are, indig are indigenous. The different Twa communities of Central Africa are another obvious group given their current low political and socio-economic status, historical and cultural trajectories, and history of discrimination by neighbouring societies in the state, and several others could be mentioned. Adding to such complexities in terms of the definitions of indigenous and its use in, in Africa, um, is the distinction between indigenous and autochthonous. The latter term is more widely used in Francophone West and Central Africa, partly because andagin, the French equivalent to in indigenous, was generally used as a term of abuse during the colonial period, era, and consequently the appellation indigenous may be considered to be insulting rather than as a desirable status. Derived from the Greek word autochthon, Autochthony means born from the soil. The term was used initially in West Africa by French colonial authorities so as to distinguish those of their colonial subjects who were of the soil and those who, despite being more recent migrants, were the rulers. Hence, like indigenous, it generally implies temporal priority of settlement and a degree of political subordination. Although, unlike the uh, self-identifying indigenous peoples such as the San, um, these communities are not necessarily marginal, but rather believe that their resources, cultural power, are threatened by migrants. Now, while African governments may be resistant to the notion of indigenous peoples on the grounds that such categorization has the potential to foster disharmony between eth ethnically diverse national populations, and perhaps we will hear more on this topic from Joan Mary Ogiogwa and Clara Blackmore, African societies commonly make distinctions within their own oral histories and traditions between first comers and late comers. A particular heritage challenge that needs to be addressed, therefore, is how do we write archaeologies and historical narratives that give due recognition to the copious material, linguistic, and genetic evidence for long histories of population migration and replacement in a manner that does not over-romanticize the social and political consequences of, of these processes or provide material that could potentially fuel the fires of ethnic conflict. <coughs> Changing tack somewhat, my next topic considers livelihoods and what uh, an understanding of cultural heritage can potentially contribute to improving these and to sustaining African environments. To start with, we should perhaps remind ourselves that roughly 65% of sub-Saharan Africans currently rely on agriculture for their livelihood, with the majority of these as subsistence pastoralists, farmers or mixed agro-pastoralists. Agriculture pro provides between 30 and 40% of the continent's GDP, Yet few farms are more than a couple of hectares in extent, and most agricultural production is organised at the household or community level, while also being at least partially commercialised. As well as having particular significance for devising sustainable futures for sub-Saharan Africans, 
The centrality of Af agriculture in most contemporary African economies also points to a long and intricate history, or more strictly histories, of food production over the course of at least seven millennia. These histories have included independent domestication of different food crops and possibly some domestic animals, the modification and manipulation of ecological niches to better suit the needs of farming and herding, the nurturing of new crossbreeds, hybrids and varieties better adapted to distinctively African ecological conditions, the exploitation of a vast array of other plant species seeming which, that seemingly have not undergo, sig undergone significant morphological change as a consequence uh, for use particularly as famine foods, the adoption of a wide range of exotic species from other parts of the world, such as banana and taro, and equally the spread of various African domesticates beyond the geographical confines of the continent. Taking the long view on African agriculture and water management reminds us also that several different agricultural systems often coexisted alongside one another, while also leaving space for the continued existence of hunter-gatherers and fishers, thereby generating sophisticated <coughs> ethno-linguistic, economic and political mosaics that diversified further with the emergence of urban communities. And most of the sub-Saharan systems which developed in both uh, rain-poor and, and rain-rich areas of intensive agriculture, sorry, were organised and operated with non-hierarchical social systems, in mar marked contrast to the command economies of Mesopotamia and other so-called uh, great civilizations. We find similar sim systems in operation today and understanding their organization has a lot to contribute to current debates over the benefits of the commercialization of water management and water as an economic good versus decentralized community management and water as a human right. As well as in a more practical sense with regard to providing models for effective capture of green water which, as Johann and Rockström and Marlin Falkenberg argued in a paper published in Nature earlier this year, will become increasingly important in the coming century if average global temperatures and their effects on rainfall distribution continue to rise at their current rate. Yet in much the same way that international interest in improving contemporary agriculture has lagged behind work on other continents, research on these topics remain limited an integrated multidisciplinary study even more so. And there are many reasons for this. Some have to do with um, a, a lack of professional, a, a lack of capacity in the scholars to do it. But I think also until recently, heritage professionals have also failed to engage with these kinds of questions, focusing more on what the tangible in, and intangible evidence can tell us about the past, but neglecting to think about uh, what African cultural heritage can do for the future. And this contrasts with the way in which uh, these issues are being addressed now in other continents, especially Latin America, South America. <coughs> so, challenge three. So key to addressing these types of challenges will be developing more sophisticated approaches to the study of human nature interactions and integrating heritage work within community development. African ecosystems are shaped by long-term interactions with a dynamic climate and increasing human interventions. Whereas in the past, the latter have often been regarded solely in a negative light, more recent research from the perspective of historical ecology has shown that there has often been a strong beneficial connection between people and ecosystems in Africa. The long history and extent of such interactions that mean that few places, if any, in Africa can be thought of as truly pristine. Yet large tracts of African landscapes now set aside for wildlife conservation are still presented in precisely these terms. And because these landscapes have been associated historically with communities that now commonly self-identify as indigenous peoples, uh, there has been the unfortunate consequence that the latter have often been presented, the, uh, these, their, their cultures, if you like, have often been presented in largely ahistorical terms and as part of nature and, as, and wilderness with additional consequences. And we'll likely hear a bit more on that from Susan Kaitemetsi. While such negative stereotyping should rightly be criticised, 
It is instructive, I think, to note that in some parts of the continent, self-identifying indigenous peoples are now positioning themselves as the rightful and original custodians of nature conservation, and many international conservation bodies are responding to such claims. While these efforts can certainly be applauded on a number, number of fronts, not least for empowering local communities and fostering greater participation in wildlife conservation efforts, and even, br and even bringing genuine economic benefits, we must also be cautious about some of these claims and not be too easily swayed by the rhetoric of sustainability. To put this another way, we need to put much more effort uh, towards establishing the temporal, de temporal depth of particular components of indigenous knowledge uh, and, and especially those that are currently being proposed as providing solutions to current environmental practices. And this is just an example of some of the work that Daryl Stump has been doing and uh, Matt Davies's work would fall very clearly within this tradition as well. And several of the speakers at this conference will no doubt have more to say on the value of indigenous and traditional knowledge, um, including uh, Ndukiaki Ndlovu, Tawanda Mukwende, Chris uh, Bunzaia, and Forget Chatterer. The points I wish to make are that while I entirely agree that indigenous knowledge, if understood as knowledge produced outside the frame of post-enlightenment Western science, has much to contribute to both managing heritage and sustaining livelihoods and environments, a key question, a key question we need to ask ourselves is whether the focus should be on identifying the same sustainability of a system or on identifying its relative resilience to both environmental and anthropogenic shocks. As Carl Walters observed in his book Adaptive Management of Renewables Resources, published almost three decades ago, the things we want to sustain are ones we assign a particular value to. Such values are always transient, variable, and mutable. Hence, what we today identify as something worth sustaining may not correspond with what people in the past identified as worth sustaining or even people in the future might do. By shifting the focus to resilience, the focus becomes on tracking the ability of a socio-ecological system to withstand such shocks without the need for radical reorganization and restructuring, and how well a community is positioned to be able to adapt and address new or ongoing problems and secure the resources to do so. <coughs> so that's my fourth challenge. One of the most effective ways to begin to address this challenge is through the development of historical ecology in a manner that complicates the notion of human environmental impacts through consideration of the possibility that human disturbance has often played a key role, as in Amazonia, in enhancing the diversity and complexity of specific ecosystems. Most African ecosystems thus need to be understood as constructed or as domesticated landscapes in which nature as much as, is as much part of the human sphere as humans are of nature. We will hear more about, about examples from West Africa in James Fraser's presentation. Um, but examples can be found from across the con continent. One example that I've been investigating is are these grazing lawns in, in uh, semi-arid uh, East African uh, landscapes associated with pastoral settlement. <coughs> now, of course, as my colleague Paul Sinclair never fails to remind me, while it is important to consider rural context and the value of African farming and herding heritage, more of Africa's population now live in urban settings. And the legacies of urbanism, the transformations in urban dwelling, and how these relate to shifting concepts of urbanity and an urban heritage and identity, and the sustainability of Africa's towns and cities, are issues that require critical consideration. The continuing growth of cities and the stimulus this will give to the extraction industries will inevitably pose increased pressures on heritage resources management. And if only a tiny proportion of those that are likely to be threatened with destruction are to be preserved, whether on record or physically, will also require far more efficient systems of archaeological impact assessment and mitigation than currently exist, and considerably more robust planning systems. I'm not convinced that the heritage professions as a whole in Africa 
have fully recognised what the scale of urban expansion is likely to be over the next half century, so it's worth quoting some figures, although these have to be used with caution. What we do know is that between 1950 and 2000, the urban percentage of the continent's population grew from 14.7 to 36.2%, and some 395 million Africans currently live in urban areas. The continent's total population is expected to rise by 60% by tw uh, 2050, with eastern, western and central Africa predicted to experience particularly rapid rises although the greatest rises are likely to happen to the next uh, 5 to 15 years. Historical trends are also worth reflecting on, as they can provide us with some sense of what might happen if no action is taken. One area for which <coughs> uh, good statistical data are available is West Africa, much of it collated by the Afri Africa, Pop Africa Polis Urbanisation Study in, we in West Africa project. These data indicate that between 1950 and 2000, the urban population in West Africa grew from 4.6 million to 74.6 million and is projected to rise to 123 million by 2020. Of more relevance to assessments of the possible scale of destruction and heritage resources around urban settlements over the last 50 to 60 years and the extent of possible future threats is the information compiled by the project on the area of land that has been built over, where future building activity is most likely to occur, and what the likely spatial extent of this will be around different categories of settlement. Overall, the data indicate that whereas between 1950 and 2000, West Africa's population grew at an average annual rate of 4.3%, the average annual expansion of urbanised surfaces, which is a bit better indicator of the level of Im potential impact on heritage resources, was 5.1%. <coughs> so how much of this land was ever inspected for archaeological remains or for the inventorying of cultural and heritage resources? We simply do not know, but it is probably true to say only an infinitesimal fraction of what has now been built upon. Can our professions continue to be so complacent about the threats posed by urban growth as they seem to have been over the past last half century? And I have a bit on my iPad that I wrote on the plane last night that I also will now have to extemporise. Um, another trend that we're seeing very significantly across Africa is large-scale land acquisitions. Um, by, particularly by uh, Asian and Arab countries, um, largely being driven uh, by the three Fs. Uh, the food crisis, the, uh, the food crisis in the early part of the 20th century, where many Asian and Arab countries with rapidly expanding urban populations found themselves unable to provide their, grow their own food to feed their populations, and they have been acquiring large tracts of land across Africa uh, for intensive agricultural uh, production, often associated with large-scale irrigation projects as well. The other Fs are uh, the fuel crisis, falls in uh, the value and significance of fossil fuels, also the rise of more green thinking, if you like, has led to a very significant rise in acquisition of land for the production of biofuels across Africa. Here, many of the players are not necessarily from Asia, and uh, the Arab countries, but actually are from Western multinationals. And finally, the financial crisis. The financial crisis also resulted in very significant uh, changes in policy, again, by many multinationals who are now investing in land and speculating on African land. And this has resulted in large-scale uh, displacement of populations and uh, considerable, uh, there's considerable uh, uncertainty about the legality of many of these deals, and there's a lot of evidence of that many of these deals are fairly corrupt deals. Um, and as Shadia Taha will tell us, no doubt, um, the, what we're seeing is increasing uh, amounts of conflict between different communities over um, this land grabbing. But I also want to make the point that these large-scale agricultural 
uh, interventions for biofuels, for uh, intensive uh, cereal crop cultivation with irrigation and so forth, are having very massive and significant effects on Africa's heritage uh, as well. Of course, it's not all gloom and despondency. Um, Shadrach Chirikuri, in a recent uh, paper in Azania on archaeological ethics, made the point that there have been a number of cases where uh, large-scale construction companies have worked very positively with archaeologists. And I'm sure that we will hear um, from Rachel King uh, later today about some of the experiences of doing that and some of the positive things that can come out of working in collaboration with these companies rather than directly opposing them, um, particularly in terms of capacity building. So there's my fifth challenge. Have I got five minutes? Finally, I want to draw this presentation to an end by returning to the issue of modernity that I introduced at the outset of this paper, to argue that more effort still needs to be directed towards transforming heritage-oriented disciplines, such as archaeology and museology, so as to avoid the constant reproduction of the dualisms of the modernity narrative, in which people must be either traditional or modern. As Peter Kashiri, Birgit Meyer, and Peter Pels remind us, we will continually reproduce the philosophical constraints of modernity's binary divisions if we do not also understand modernity from Africa. Kashiri and his colleagues argue that modernity is and was intimately uh, bound with African history. Looked at from Africa, they argue, one cannot but place modernity in the context of the transatlantic trading of human beings for money. It was and is impossible to be modern in Africa without drawing on this heritage of slavery, whether it appears as the pan-Africanist sources of African nationalism or as the popularity of rap music among today's African youth. Both modern capitalism and the current meaning of the word Africa derive in part from black, uh, the Black Atlantic. Also, we cannot but place modernity in the context of commodities that left the African continent to fuel industrialization in Europe and America, such as ivory from East Africa and cocoa from West African farms. The first steam-powered cotton mill built in the United States, the Naumke Cotton Mill in Salem, Massachusetts, which opened in 18, 1847, for example, was built specifically to produce cotton cloth that could be traded for ivory hides and copal in mainland, uh, from mainland East Africa, so as to fuel the expanding shoe and furniture industries of Salem and Boston and the manufacture of piano keys and other ivory processing in the small towns of Ivoryton and Deep River, Connecticut. Similarly, as Gareth Austin has noted, the widespread introduction of industrial bar chocolate into Britain would have looked quite different if it had happened at all, were it not for the astonishing rise in cocoa production in Ghana, then the Gold Coast, between 1890 and 1911, which rocketed the British colony from negligible production to the status of leading world exporter. The major chocolate companies in Britain and the US, Cadbury, Roundtree, Hershey, Bars, rose to global dominance, in part because Ghanaian farmers supplied them with vast quantities of superior cocoa beans. Situating African heritage within narratives of modernity will require new multi-sided approaches that acknowledge how entangled world histories have been, how entangled world histories have been over the millennia, and which explore the shifting influences and contributions of different cultures and societies, acknowledging the power of heritage to shape lives and to change cultural registers many, many miles away. Put another way, we need more research on the antiquity of African cultural hybridity and its legacies both on the continent and elsewhere in the world. Without this, we will always be struggling con to contest the stereotypical views of Africa as a continent of cultural stasis and as a remnant of a pre-modern world, rather than as having been a key player in the making of the modern world and all its attendant consequences. Anyway, I won't go on any longer. I hope some of the things I've said have given you something to think about. I certainly look forward to hearing all of you speak and to listen to 
what our other keynote speakers, Paul Basu and Weber and Doro, have to say on this topic. So I will end with a final slide and the thought that maybe our key challenge is how best to enable the youth of Africa to take control of their cultural heritage. And that at the end of the day, in whatever we do to protect, preserve and promote Africa's diverse cultural heritage, as the Nigerian playwright and Nobel Prize winner for literature, Wallace Sayinke, once observed, we also need to leave the dead some room to dance. Thank you very much. Thank you.